Neurocognitive aging is a dynamic field, constantly evolving through emerging methodologies and advancements. Neurocognitive aging studies, including studies of Alzheimer's disease, rely on data collected from populations. It is therefore critical for researchers to carefully consider research methods such as data collection, study design, and their respective design biases. In this video, we will discuss introductory study designs and methodological issues in neurocognitive aging research. After viewing this video, you should be able to distinguish observational versus experimental study designs, identify and discuss specific types of observational study designs and distinguish these designs from randomized clinical trials, identify methodological issues in brain aging studies. Study design is a systematic way of trying to foresee the processes and steps of an experiment, a scientific study, so that we collect the most unbiased type of data that we can collect, and we can actually utilize that data in order to build statistical and scientific inferences. There's definitely different types of study designs that are utilized, and they're overall divided into two broader categories, observational studies and experimental types of studies. So observational and experimental studies differ in a pretty large way. Observational studies are used to investigate whether an association exists between an exposure and outcome. Exposure and or disease are compared between groups, but no attempt is made to experimentally manipulate or interfere with the outcome. An exposure can be a certain behavior such as diet or smoking while the outcome is usually a disease, such as Alzheimer's disease. In experimental study designs, participants are randomized to receive a new treatment versus standard treatment and or placebo. Thereafter, the outcomes are compared between groups. The treatment introduced is often a drug or a preventive program. If you are just interested in looking at, say, the rate of occurrence of something, then you could do something like an observational study where you're able to just count the number of times something happens. You're not doing any kind of intervention. You're just following them over time, and you'll keep track of who those people are. You might be able to look at their demographics and do some statistics, but you're not really applying anything to the group that you're looking at in order to see a difference or an outcome. It's for that reason that we're not able to make very strong causal statements from our observational data. For that, we need experimental designs. In any type of study design, data are collected and exposures and outcomes are measured in groups of individuals. In every scientific endeavor, we need to step back and ask the question, how did we collect this data? Before you begin to look at data, what's really critically important is to understand how was it set up? What was the study designed? Was it an observational study? Was it a case control study? Was it a cohort study? So before I can make interpretations and say that, okay, there is a clear link between this exposure and this outcome, it's very important to understand how were these data collected and what types of study design was used. If we do not inquire about the quality of the data, the chances that all of our inferences and predictions will be built upon potentially a bias type or accumulation of data. When we step back and ask the question of knowing your data, then we have a chance to correct those sources of bias prior to embarking upon the next phases of analysis. In this section, we learned that most studies in populations can be broadly categorized as observational or experimental. In studies with an observational design, the association between a variable and outcome is measured without trying to change the outcome. In studies with an experimental design, individuals are randomly assigned to a new treatment versus standard treatment and or placebo group, and then the groups are followed and outcomes are compared. Experimental and observational studies can be broken down even further into more specific study designs. There are many types of study design, 
Here, we will focus on a few types that are commonly used for research in groups of individuals. So the different types of observational studies include cross-sectional studies, case control studies, and cohort studies. And in a cross-sectional study, it's a one snapshot in time. You're collecting a person's exposure as well as the disease and one time period. Cross-sectional studies survey populations or groups of people. The census is an example of a large cross-sectional survey. These surveys collect exposure and disease data simultaneously at one specific point in time. Data is collected in a specific population, but the group is not followed over time. Therefore, cross-sectional studies cannot be used to identify new cases of incident disease or causes of disease. And so this type of cross-sectional study will allow you to look to see if groups differ depending on, say, different types of conditions, but doesn't necessarily let you track the progress of a condition within an individual. Case control studies are also used to examine the relationship between an exposure and disease. This is done by identifying individuals with the disease, who are called cases, and comparing them to a group of people without the disease, who are called controls. Exposure data such as lifestyle, genetics, and or environmental factors are collected and compared between the cases and controls. So you begin with the disease individual, for example, someone who may have diabetes, and you ask them about what types of foods they're eating. Compared to you have a group of people who don't have diabetes, those are your controls. And so you compare those cases and controls and you see what are the odds of increased diabetes in an individual who's eating more fatty foods compared to someone who's not eating fatty foods. In a cohort study, a group of exposed or unexposed individuals, both without disease, are identified and then followed over time. Exposures in those who newly develop the disease are compared with exposures in those who remain healthy. Researchers can examine the relationship between multiple exposures, such as diet and physical activity, with multiple newly occurring diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease and diabetes, within the cohort over that time period. Examples of cohort studies include the Nurses' Health Study and the Framingham Cohort Study. The importance of a cohort study is that you follow the whole cohort individuals in time to see whether they've acquired this disease or not. Alzheimer's disease and other related dementia, ADRD, are debilitating conditions that slowly destroy memory thought processes and functions primarily among older adults. So I got into Alzheimer's research uh, as a neurologist by seeing young onset form of the disease. But when I started seeing families that get it when they're 40, I became very interested in it uh, from many different perspectives. So what we do is essentially a cohort study, an observational study that is not an interventional study, in which we're following these families and members of these families over time, uh, preferably, hopefully every year, uh, and examining them, performing serial tests of memory and thinking, serial imaging studies, um, seeing how the disease develops. Although cohort studies can be expensive and are subject to participant dropout, of the observational study designs, Cohort studies can establish a temporal sequence between the exposure and the disease. That is, a cohort study can distinguish which came first, the exposure or disease, because at the start of the study, no participants have the disease. And therefore, cohort studies can suggest a causal link between the exposure and disease. Let's pause and compare the three study designs more carefully. The time required for cross-sectional and case control studies is relatively short, while cohort studies are generally conducted over time, even years. Exposure and disease data are collected simultaneously in cross-sectional studies, while case control studies recruit patients with disease, called the cases, and also a comparison group without the disease, called the controls. And then past exposure, such as diet or exercise, is collected. For cohort studies, participants are recruited who do not have a disease at the start of the study. The cohort is followed over time and exposures are compared between those who newly develop the disease, incident disease, and those who don't. In cross-sectional and case control studies, it is not clear whether exposure or disease comes first, 
However, temporal sequence can be established in cohort studies because all participants are disease-free at the start of the study period. The cost of cross-sectional and case control studies is relatively inexpensive, but cohort studies are more expensive. And finally, there is no randomization into groups for any of the three study designs. That is, individuals are not randomly assigned into any groups. Randomized clinical trials, RCTs, are a common type of experimental design. Although many trials are outside the clinical setting and are often referred to as randomized trials, both cohort studies and randomized trials can suggest causation by establishing the temporal sequence between an exposure and a subsequent disease outcome. However, the key difference is randomization. In a randomized trial, participants are randomized to receive a new type of treatment versus a standard treatment and or placebo, and then followed to see improvement or no improvement in both groups. In randomized trials where the treatment is a medication, People who don't receive the medication receive a placebo, which is a false treatment that is expected to have no therapeutic value, like a capsule filled with sugar. One group of people receives the intervention, whereas the other group of people does not receive the intervention. You will randomly assign people to one of these conditions, whether that be a medication, a drug, whether it be a physical activity and you will be looking for outcomes depending on whether or not they received the drug or the placebo. In this section, we learned that most common types of observational studies are cross-sectional, case control, and cohort studies. In all three study designs, the aim is to investigate whether there is a relationship between the exposure and disease. In cross-sectional studies, exposure and outcome data are collected simultaneously in case control studies, we begin with diseased and non-diseased individuals and collect past exposure. In cohort studies, we begin with exposure and no exposure and follow both groups in time to compare the incidence of disease. The most common type of experimental studies are randomized trial designs in which subjects are randomly assigned to a new treatment versus a standard treatment and or placebo, and then the difference in outcome is compared between groups. One type of study bias is selection bias, which occurs when participants are erroneously recruited or selected from certain sources or groups. For example, if controls are selected from churches or at a fraternity from a university campus, then their behaviors and or exposures may be different than the general surrounding population. Regardless, at the beginning of a study, we want to carefully consider recruitment and criteria for eligibility into the study. Another major issue with research studies is confounding. Some of the key methodological issues in conducting cohort studies, case control studies, observational studies, and or experimental studies are of course in recruitment in your population. How are you recruiting these participants? Is there selection bias? When there is a source of bias and it's not being corrected or accounted for, it will remain throughout the entire period of the studies. So if you're interested in outcomes related to sleep and say cardiovascular health, but you only look at older adults and not younger adults, then you might come to the conclusion that cardiovascular disease and sleep have some causal relationship. But this might not necessarily be the case. It might be that your population of old participants are more likely to have cardiovascular disease and more likely to have sleep disturbances. They could be related, but they might not be. In order to really adequately look at this, you'd want to make sure that you, say, have a young or middle-aged population as well to really see whether or not these things are linked um, and if they are linked in a way where one might be contributing to the other. There are many methodological issues that exist when researchers are choosing who to include in their Alzheimer's disease studies. One of the main challenges is that the symptoms are nearly impossible to identify in the early stages of the disease. Because in the earliest stages of the disease, pathology and other changes may be present in the brain, but outward symptoms and cognitive difficulties are not yet evident. Therefore, people with disease might be incorrectly recruited to the non-diseased or control group. When we think of Alzheimer's disease, we're thinking of patients who have already been diagnosed and probably thinking of the end stage where you really know that you have someone who is unwell. 
But a lot of the research is showing that some of these brain changes related to Alzheimer's disease are occurring long before any of the symptoms that we notice appear. So long before cognitive symptoms show up. So there's a lot of little nuanced effects that we have to take into consideration when we're thinking about how to capture this early preclinical part of the disease. Um, and that could lead to some methodological challenges. Another important consideration in Alzheimer's disease and dementia-related research is the quality of data collected via proxy. The main issue is that even a close relative may not provide complete or entirely accurate information requested about a patient, which may limit what conclusions can be drawn about study participants who have dementia. So in our studies and in almost every study in which you're actually studying people with dementia, proxy interviews are involved. That is, they almost all involve a study partner, someone who knows the participant well, who can tell, give an objective view about how they're doing with regards to their symptoms. Uh, this is because frequently people are, have lost insight and can't tell you about how they're doing. So persons serving as proxies in our studies are someone who knows the uh, participant well. Um, that's typically a, a spouse or an adult child. In this section, we learned about challenges in collecting and using data in Alzheimer's disease studies. These challenges include minimizing selection bias, which may be introduced during recruitment into the study, difficulty diagnosing the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease when disease is asymptomatic, having incomplete information available about study participants who need a medical proxy to help them answer questions about exposure and other variables. To fix many of these issues prior to study initiation, researchers should understand and consider which study design to use, carefully outline study criteria, cast a broad net for recruiting participants, and subsequently may be able to address these issues during the statistical analysis phase. Uh, science is expensive. <laughs> Uh, neuroimaging in particular is expensive. These machines that collect these data cost millions of dollars. Millions of dollars to buy and millions of dollars to operate. So when you're trying to collect data on lots of people, you need to be very efficient at how you do that. Your design has to be practical. You have to get the study done after all. So if it's so expensive or takes so long or so difficult to do, you're never going to get the answer. And so you need to think about these things as you design these projects so that one, you can convince your funder to pay for it, but also that you can actually collect the data and do the study.